stuff. Good stuff. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so we're talking Daniel, as we have been for the past couple weeks. I am specifically talking on Daniel 3. Um, yeah, I'm going to get right into it. I, I feel like I've got some stuff that is uh, going to be really helpful, and I don't want to run out of time, so we're just going to jump right in. Um, so if you're tracking, if you've been tracking along with, with us, we've obviously covered Daniel 1 and 2, but then also j- jumped to Daniel 4. Um, I, I've been noticing this trend, and as you read Daniel, and as I read as I read Daniel, I was noticing this trend in Daniel where you've got these exiles, right? The Jewish, the Jewish people, um, they're taken away from Jerusalem. Some of them are, because it, it happened in waves. But some of them are taken from Jerusalem, and now they're exiles in this foreign land um, in Babylon. And they don't belong. They don't fit in. They are uh, foreigners. They probably even speak a different language, you know. People don't understand them quite as well. And I see them just standing out, sticking out like a sore thumb, you know. The, the king gives them a command and says, uh, you know, you're in my royal court. He gives this to Daniel and to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you, you've got to eat all my food and have the wine, wine I prepare. And they're, and they're like, no, like, no, sorry, we can't, can't do it. it. That's, That's against our law, the law that we got, got from God. God. So, so, so they, they stand, stand out as the exception. exception. They, they say, yes, yes everyone, everyone else is following us, but not us. us. And, and I, I see this, this pattern, pattern happening where the exception starts out as an exception, but then when people see the results of it standing out as an exception, it suddenly becomes the norm. It starts out as, this is weird, <laughs> and it finishes as, oh yeah, this is the kind of the right way we should have been doing it all along, right? So that, so that happens there in the first story, because they start eating the vegetables, that's all they didn't eat, things prepared food, and now suddenly they're healthier than everybody else, and they're smarter, and they're, they're more advanced, and they're going, wow, this is really working, right? And you got, please, please go ahead and keep doing this, right? The, the, what was weird at first became normal, and you see that in the second chapter as well, where the king says, I'm not going to tell you what this dream was I had. I had this crazy dream. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to tell me what it is and interpret it for me. And all the magicians and everyone in the king's court, no one can interpret it, no one can tell them what it is. They can't read his mind, right? It's, it's, like, that's a very fair thing to say. I'm sorry, I can't read your mind, so I can't interpret your dream. But, but there was somebody named Daniel who was willing to believe himself to be the exception to the rule because of the God that he served. The, 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 the natural law that held everyone else back, that they can't read minds, that, that, that didn't apply to him. See, because he was, he, he was, part, of, he was part of God's family. He was, he was part of God's family, so that, that rule didn't apply to him. And suddenly, so he goes in and interprets the dream, and then suddenly, that, that exceptional experience that Daniel had is now this thing that the king recognizes and promotes him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and that becomes the norm, right? This God from Israel is now, is now on stage. It was a little weird to start, but now it's normal. And so now we're in Daniel 3, and this is the story of uh, Rash, Shadrach, and Benny. If you've seen Veggie Tales, which I'm sure anyone kind of like my age or younger has, if you haven't, you need to watch Veggie Tales. Uh, Rash, Shadrach, and Benny. This is funny, people were asking me to sing the Bunny song. I'm not going to sing the Bunny song for uh, so, so Rash, Shadrach, and Benny, I'm going to refer to them as that like regularly just because that's been ingrained in me. So if it annoys you, I'm sorry, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, the story starts out in chapter 3 where this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, um, who had previously been shown the miraculous power of God through Daniel, and somehow along the way, in a period of time, apparently kind of forgot that, uh, he creates this massive golden image and in the middle of this, this valley, in the middle of this, this area. Um, and he commands everyone, especially the leaders, he, he focuses on the leaders and he commands everyone to say, when you hear music of any kind, when I play the music, when anybody plays the music, you have to bow down and worship this image. And I had this thing in my heart as I'm reading this, I'm going, oh man, there's a lot of people playing music for you right now. No, I mean, take, take this for what it is. There's a lot of people who are trying to make you dance, right? There's a lot of people trying to make you bow. And I'm just going to tell you this, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of manipulation. And music is sometimes an avenue to manipulate. Um, and, and so I think that's part of this here. Is the king's going, I'm going to manipulate you through my power and through music to do this act that you otherwise wouldn't do. 
And, and so, so we call them, them to do it. it. And, and well, let, me, let me just say this too, because I, I feel like this is... So, so everybody's, I think, trying to put us and put, put me and put, put you and put everyone into boxes so that they can control them. them. It's, um, even, even look, look at the king. king. What, what does he do as soon as these Jewish people are brought to him? Well, he, he renames them. He puts them in a box. He, he, he doesn't call them by their Jewish name, the name of their birth. He calls them by the name of his rulership. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I love that they use those names because all three of those names, I'm just going to tell you, basically what they, all, what they all symbolically represent are servitude to the king and servitude to the king's gods. And he, so he calls them by these names repetitively as if to say, this is who you are now. You, you serve me, you serve my gods. You're not, you're not servants of the living God of Jerusalem anymore, where you came from. No, now I own you. So, so he renames them to put them in a category so that, so that he's basically standing up there saying, hey, stop in his foot, you know. You guys, you guys are under me now. I'm the one in control. So anyway, as you probably know, the music plays. The image is in the field. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they're leaders of provinces, and they don't bow. They say, nope, not us. We're the exception to the rule, like we always have been. <laughs> we're, we're, we don't fit your category. That's not who we are. <laughs> and they don't bow. And I want to point this out, too. They're, I think we, we do... I'll say this, I do, because I do. There is a, um, some, there's an attractive quality to being rebellious. And I think sometimes we're rebellious for all the wrong reasons. But that's not this story, right? I think, I think and you can probably even see this in our culture, there's this attractive quality right now to rebelling against authority figures of any kind, at any time, for any reason, right? Just because you don't like it, because you don't like them, or because you feel like you need to be in control. That, that's not what they're doing here. They're, they're rebelling for all the right reasons, right? This guy's saying, distance yourself from your God and come serve my God. And then you go, no, sorry, that's not who we are, right? So, so it's for all the right reasons. But they don't bow. The king's advisors and some of the other leaders, they, they of course, see that these, Jew, these Jews are not bowing. And uh, they come to him and they're, you know, hey, these Jews aren't bowing. And they say it in that voice um, because that's what the Bible says. Um, and, then, and, and then, so these guys are real turds, you know what I mean? Like, they, like, and it happens, like, more than once where these advisors are bad news. Uh, but so they, they tattle on them. And uh, this makes Nebuchadnezzar pretty angry. So here's where we're going to pick up reading in verse 13. And, you know, before I read this, let me just say this real quick, too. I have found in this season uh, relying on Scripture is maybe the most important thing. There, there are seasons, and this is something even that the pastors brought up. Uh, I remember Mike said it in one of the leaders' meetings. He was saying, you know, they really felt like for this year, this was last year, before any of this COVID stuff and election stuff and all this other stuff, they were saying, we really feel like we're impressed that we need to be relying on Scripture heavily. Um, and, and I have felt this in my heart where I'm going, I, it's weird, I'm not maybe reading as much as I used to, but I'm relying on it more. Like, I'm getting stuck in spots, and I'm living there, and I'm planting roots in my heart. And I just want to tell you, if, if you feel like things are chaotic, and there's shifting movement, and you can't catch on to what normal is anymore, and everything feels out of whack, spend a little time rooting yourself in Scripture. Um, it's really important, I think, in this season. Okay, so, sorry, that was a, that was a, a tangent, but it's important. Um, so, verse 13. So, remember, they didn't bow. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, he covered all of it there, uh, if you are ready to fall down and worship the, th the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And I love their response. This response, like I was reading, I'm just stunned by this response. So I'm going to read through it like kind of slow because I'm like, this is awesome. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Whew. I'm just like, whoa. 
Because here's the thing. I think, you know, they could probably reference history here and say, hey, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, remember when you had that dream that nobody could interpret for you? Everyone who serves your gods and worships the image you set up, they couldn't interpret for you. Remember that? Remember the person who could? He served our God, and we're not betraying our allegiance to our God. They could have defended their, themselves before him, couldn't they? And, and they might have had a case that might have shifted, shifted his, his opinion, opinion a little bit. bit but, but, you know, know they, 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 there's, there's this verse I read in Isaiah. I thought, I thought it was really cool. cool. It's, um... I'm trying to remember here. Okay, okay yeah, yeah, so, so it's, uh, the, the fruit, fruit of righteousness, righteousness is peace. The fruit of righteousness is peace. Its, its effect is quietness and confidence forever. Isn't, Isn't that a good, good verse? The, the, the fruit of righteousness is peace. Its, its effect is quietness and confidence forever. And you see this right here. They're just like, I got nothing to prove to you, man. <laughs> you know? Like, you want me to bow, you want... I, I got, I got nothing, nothing to prove to you. I don't even have to give a defense. And they move on and they say this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace. Well, hold on. So I want to go back to this again. I think sometimes we look at stubbornness as a bad thing. We say being stubborn is bad. It's not bad if you're stubborn for the right stuff. We, the, when stubbornness is bad is when we're stubborn over stuff that you shouldn't be stubborn over, right? You should be this pointless stuff that doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> and we get in arguments with people over stuff that doesn't matter. But, but there's nothing wrong with being stubborn if you're stubborn for the right reasons. All right? So, and I sense that, and they're going, no, like, we're not budging on this. So they say, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, Your Majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Oh, that's powerful, man. That's powerful. I'm going to ask you this question. How many have gone through a situation where you feel like you're under some sort of fire or some sort of oppression or some sort of challenge in your life right now? You don't have to raise your hand, but in your heart. You know. You know what it is to be oppressed. You know what it is to have somebody trying to, you know, turn your arm there, you know, bend you backwards, right? And they're just saying, no, no, that's not what God has called us to do. He's not called us to that. And I just got stuck on this part. Here's where I got stuck. Why were they so confident God would deliver them from it? Let's read that verse again. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from, us and from it, and he will deliver us. I'm putting myself in their shoes. I might not bow before the king, but I'm probably not also going to like put God on the spot and say, yeah, God, you know, he's going to do it for me. He's saving me. Because maybe, I, you know, I find that spot, I'm going to go, well, maybe, maybe I'm a martyr, right? Maybe, maybe this is my end, right? But there was something in them. They had confidence for some reason. And, and it's, it's a firm confidence. They had some firm confidence here to say, yeah, no. We're, we're, he's going to save us. And it's interesting, the, the Bible references this, I think, subtly later on in the New Testament. It references the story and it gives us a hint to what's going on here. Um, Hebrews 11, 33 and 34. I love Hebrews 11. It's kind of like the how many degrees of separation between Kevin Bacon. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like, like everything kind of links back to Hebrews 11 um, <laughs> somehow. Uh, so, it references this. It's talking about all these heroes of the faith. And it's talking about, um, you know, these great acts and miracles and things they encountered in their life. And, and I just want to tell you this before I even read it. You know, all of these people that you see as heroes of faith, they were all exceptions to the rule. You read through this stuff. This stuff is not normal that they're doing. But I'm going to tell you this. If you're going to be exceptional in your life, you have to somehow become okay with being the exception. At some point, you've got to be like, hey, I'm not normal. <laughs> like, and it's nothing wrong. Like, I'm not saying I'm being weird for the purpose of being weird. It's, it's I'm not normal because I'm separate to him. It's, it's, it's this, this different, different thing, right? Um, and, and you can, can see that in all the lives. And, and in 33 and 34 of Hebrews 11, it says, Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. And here we have some references to events in Daniel. Who shut the mouths of lion, lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. So this gives us a hint. It tells us this was an act of faith. They had faith in something. It wasn't this blind confidence. They, they, they had faith. And where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had heard something. They had heard something. And it was powerful. I, um, a couple weeks ago, 
it's kind, <laughs> kind of a silly story, but in light of kind of the intensity of the story, but um, I, I was, it was here, uh, we were at church, and I was drinking some water, and I had to go to the bathroom, so I walked into the bathroom with our little, you know, little thing of water that we have with this, with this screw on lid, and I walked in, and I opened the stall door, and I dropped the lid on the ground, and um, so anyway, these are like split second thoughts happening, I'm, I'm elaborating here, they're split second thoughts, and I go, Oh man, can I put that lid back? It's on the bathroom floor, like in the stall. Like, is this like gonna be okay? Because it like landed on the side that like you're gonna screw on the cap. I'm like, my mouth's gonna be out of there. Do I really want to do that? But but anyway, so that thought goes through my head, and then an immediate thought follows. And and Scott and Claire love. Well, maybe you won't love this, but my immediate thought was, oh, it's fine. Scott and Claire, they're like diligent cleaners of this bathroom. This floor, this floor is like. It is the cleanest bathroom floor. I'm good. I picked it up and I screwed it back on. <laughs> Their reputation preceded them, right? But I don't know. They probably wouldn't recommend that. But, uh, but, but anyway, but that, that was my thought and I did it. And I'm going, I think there's something to that in this story. I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in this really weird situation where this king is asking them to bow, and they're going, you know what? It's the nature and character of my God to save me. There, it's his reputation to save me. And you know what? We've seen it happen in Daniel's life. right? We've seen God do the miraculous to save us already. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. And I think, you know, and even in the New Testament, you might say, well, that's not really hearing anything from God. I think it is, though, because if you look at the New Testament, um, there's a story about the woman with the issue of blood. She, she's, she has this issue of blood. That she's bleeding constantly. Doctors can't help her with it. Um, and, you know, she never heard Jesus talk. Jesus is alive, and he's preaching, and he's healing people. She never heard her talk. She heard somebody else tell her about his reputation. And so, and so in that hearing was a hearing of truth, and that truth turned into this, this faith that rooted in her heart and caused her to act. It's really cool. But you know what? I, I think that's part of it. I think that's absolutely part of the equation here. I think there's something else here going on too, though, that, I, that is really special and cool. So Daniel, the, the story of Daniel is happening at the same time as a couple other books of the Bible. So the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah were contemporaries of Daniel. They, they lived in the same time frame. And they're often prophesying about Israel and Jerusalem. But there are instances where they prophesy to the exiles as well. So we've got this timeline that I'm going to put up here on the screen that, that I think is kind of cool. And I, I have to preference, preference, preference this. Um, so biblical timelines. This is not going to be, I don't think, like 100% exact. It's really hard. Like in the Bible it doesn't say... Daniel enters exile in 605 BC. Like, there's nothing like that. It's like, in this king's year of reign, in this time period, after this event, you kind of got to, like, figure it out. And uh, <laughs> I spent too much time trying to make sure this was right. So, I, I mean, I'm going to tell you, I think it's pretty good. But, um, but anyway, if you want to study it out, you can. Janet was telling me, nobody's going to check you on this, Jack. And I was like, that's why I got to get it right, because nobody, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, this is, I think, what the opinion of scholars would be um, if, if, you know, they were here. Um, so Daniel enters exile in 605 BC, BC, and remember, BC gets closer to zero as time moves forward. All right, so... Um, and then Daniel gives the interpretation of the first dream in 603 or 602 BC. And you'll notice, I'm going to skip by the, the next dot that's about Jeremiah 29. But um, if you skip forward, the fiery furnace, it's believed probably, maybe, likely happened uh, around 587 BC. Um, that's, that's not coming from scripture, I'll tell you that. The, uh, it is coming, well, not what we consider like, you know, scripture. But it's coming from historical accounts in later manuscripts of scripture that we don't necessarily have in our Bibles, right? It's, it's in like the Septuagint and other. Uh, but it's a historical account that says it happened in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, and that's where that date comes from. Okay, so anyway, you can study that out. It's not, it's not scripture, but there is some historical reference, and it's likely around that date. What happens in between that time period is Jeremiah prophesies to the exiles, and he gives this word, and we know that this word in Jeremiah 29 actually made it to them because Daniel references it later on. Um, this word in Jeremiah 29 talks about how there are false prophets in Israel. There's false prophets in Jerusalem, and they're prophesying, basically, that this is the effect of it. They're prophesying that this is going to kind of be a short exile. And Jeremiah is going, don't listen to them, they're lying to you. It's not short, it's going to be 70 years long. Plant your roots there, have families there, better the kingdom that you're living in, you'll be, you know, work for the betterment, because you're going to be here a while. 
And so, and then you probably have heard Jeremiah 29, 11, right? That's probably, a, if you've been in church um, for, for a while, that's a very famous verse. And that's the context of this. Jeremiah is literally prophesying it here in Jeremiah 29 to Daniel and to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's giving them a word season. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's enough to just depend on, hey, this is what uh, the character of God is, this is who he is. But there's going to be instances in your life where you need a word for that season of time. Where it's got to come, and it's got to be to you, and it's got to be for you in that moment, and only the Spirit of God can do that for you. In this instance, Jeremiah's prophecy comes to them likely before this fiery furnace event. So, this is likely the word that they're standing on while they stand before the king. This is likely the reason they stand in confidence before him. I'm going to read Jeremiah 29, 11, because this is for this instance. I really believe this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And I believe that they were reading that, and they were believing that for years prior to this event, going, oh, God's plan is not to harm us. He's got a future and a hope for us. This might be an exile that we're living here in, but God told us to plant roots and better this kingdom, and we're going to do that. We've got a destiny and a purpose. I, um, it's funny, Isaac was sitting in front of us in worship, and on his sweat, on his like, hoodie, in the back, it said, born for this, over and over again, born for this, born for this, born for this, born for this. And I felt this in my heart to tell you guys, you're born for this. You're born for this. This is not a mistake, the life you're living. You being in the midst of trials and tribulations, you going through the furnace, that's not, that's not an accident. You're born for this. You're born for this. You're born for this. Over and over again, hear that truth. You're born for this. You're not here by accident. God has a purpose and a plan for you. And um, in and, and a future, right? And so, and I'm going to read this other verse in Jeremiah 29. This is the other part of the prophecy, right? It's not all happy, happy, good stuff. Some of it's like judgment of God. Here it comes, okay? So, uh, Jeremiah 29, 20, uh, 21 and 22. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says about Ahab, son of Kaleah, and Zedekiah, son of Messiah, I don't know, I'm messing up these names, uh, who are prophesying lies to you in my name. I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will put them to death before your very eyes. Because of them, all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon will use this curse. May the Lord treat you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. And I just felt like, man, this is something they're probably reading this and going, yeah, that curse isn't for me. That curse might have been for those false prophets, but not for Rashak and Benny. They're the exceptions. They stand out. This is their purpose, is to be different. And I'm going to tell you that's your purpose, too, to stand out. Think about your life and the areas of your life where you have interaction with people. Think about your communities that you live in, the job that you work. Think about your friends, your family. I'm just going to tell you, you're not supposed to be just like everybody else. You're supposed to be someone who stands out because you trust the living God. And there is such a different quality to people who trust the living God. They don't give up. They, they end up getting through stuff that you didn't think they'd get through, and they come out the other end better for it. There's a quality to people who trust the living God, and you're supposed to carry that. Don't hide it. This is who you are. And so I just, I just put this on, on the screen in big letters. Be the exception. Be the exception. Be the exception. Daniel 3.23, the story goes on. And these three men, firmly tied, talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they end up throwing them in, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around this fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. And this is really cool. And so he's going, whoa, this is not what I expected. <laughs> right? There's going to be moments of that in your life as you trust God. They might see a fourth man in the fire with you. You know? We're, we're meant to be living this life in a way where people can see God. And they go, oh, there's a bright light there. Yeah. I, um, let, me, let me do this. I wanted to, uh, in worship, I felt like God wanted me to read this. I, um, I wrote a poem. Let's see if I can pull it up here. I wrote a poem, and uh, I felt like I wanted to read it here, and I wanted to share one thought about it. And here it is. 
It's about the, story, the poem is The Happy Cloud. There once was a cloud who started to cry. His friend, Happy Cloud, wanted to know why. Why do you cry, asked the cloud to his friend. I am heavy inside and just can't hold it in. Sad cloud brought rain and then terrible storms. Lower and lower he poured and he poured. But Happy Cloud knew what would cheer up his friend, so he lowered down near and lifted his head. I'll help with the weight. Let's take it up high where the big clouds live, way up in the sky. He carried his friend to the large wisp clouds. They noticed the tears. They felt them drip down. Let's spread you out thin, said the wisp with a grin. Let's spread out the burden on the strength of the wind. The wisp stretched the cloud, happy cloud joined in two, until sad cloud could feel his form was made new. No longer balled up, no longer so tight, no longer heavy with the weight of his might. The wind was his strength, he, was fi he finally felt free. What a powerful ally this wind it could be. Happy cloud did a dance, his friend now joined in. They were both like the wisps, as free as the wind. Remember your form that you were but dust, so spread out on the wind, and there learn to trust. And, and the part I wanted to tell you was, you know, sometimes we're, we're looking for the answer of God to be for him to remove the heaviness. But really what the answer is, is actually you getting spread thin. <laughs> that's, that's not a word people love to hear, but I'm going to tell it to you. Sometimes the answer is not God taking away a circumstance or taking away the fiery furnace. You know what sometimes it is? Is going through it. It's spreading you thin so that you don't even have the strength to carry it. You can't do it. You can't survive the flames. You can't make it through. So God's going, I'm going I'm to be there with you. I'm going to be there with you. We're going through though and you're going to grow in this. Sometimes God actually spreads you out thin for, for, your, own, for your own good. Have you felt spread thin? Huh? I've been there. I've been there. Hold on, I've got to get back to the slides here. <laughs> That's a fun story. All right. So here's what, here, last thing I got here. Um, I, I was kind of like praying through this and I just felt like there's this thing that can be a stronghold in your life if you don't, if you don't get to the root of it. And it's, it's this idea of being a victim. Um, you know, the, it's amazing. You look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They weren't victims in this moment. They weren't saying, woe is me, I've been exiled not for something I did wrong, but because everyone else in my nation, they were sinners and the kings were evil and look at me, now we're stuck here in Babylon and now I've got to be under the thumb of this dictator of a king who's putting all this pressure on me to bend. Like, they're, not, they're not doing all that. They, they could have. <laughs> I know I've done stuff like that when things have been hard on my life, but they didn't do that. They approached it like, no, God's got a plan for us in the future. The goodness of God is here. This is kind of tying to what uh, Buddy's word. Like, w the eyes were on the hope. They weren't on the struggle. And I just want to say this about, about being a victim. You can only hang on to, to being, being a victim, victim so long before, before you, you give up your victory. victory. You, you really, it really doesn't work to, to hang on to being a victim. Because, you know, we've, we've all been through some stuff. Everybody has. Some, some people more than others, <laughs> to tell the truth. I, uh, I asked Shannon about this. I'm not going to share anything, but I mean, before we met, she had gone through some serious trauma, traumas multiple in her life. Um, and we, we talk about this thing about being a victim. Like, you can't, you're never going to be healthy if you stay there. And you, and you leverage victimhood as a crutch. Because here's what it does. Being the victim takes takes our eyes off of the living God who gives us victory and it puts us on all the excuses for why we can never win. It relieves us of the responsibility of being exceptional and being exceptions in this world and it excuses it so that we don't have to feel guilty about it. That's why we do it is because we go, we're not exceptional. We buy the lie. We put ourselves in the box, man. We say, I'm not exceptional. God, God might love me, kind of, kind of, but he doesn't love me like that person or that person. You know, no, you know what? He gave his son for you. You're exceptional for you. You're exceptional. Who gives their son for somebody? And he gave him for you. You're exceptional already. And, uh, and so what I, I had this in my mind, I, I've been dealing with this too, where sometimes the victim who doesn't come from somebody else, sometimes it comes from ourselves. You know, uh, sometimes when you're feeling like a failure, you're really, what you're really saying is I'm a victim of my own mistakes. And we live in our own failures rather than learning to victory over the failures through Christ. 
And I want us to do this. This is going to be an activity. I did this this week because I was, to be perfectly honest, I was feeling like a failure in a few areas of my life. Believe it or not, people who preach feel like failures sometimes, right? Um, and, uh, and so I'm going, man, God, uh, how, do, how do I break through this thing of feeling like, I'm, like I failed so strongly? And I felt like it gave me Romans 8, 35 to 37. And we're going to read this, and then afterwards I've got an activity here. But uh, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are, con- we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things. What things? All these things. And look at the things that they were. Shall, you know, trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. All the things that make us a victim. Everything that makes our life hard. All the excuses we could have had that we do have if we want to use them. You know, it's all these things. We're not victims in this circumstance. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors who through him who loved us. And here's the beauty of it. It's not on your shoulders anymore. This is it, right? We, we, we're so concerned about absorbing the guilt and we don't want to feel responsible when we make mistakes. Well, guess what? It's on him now. It's through him who loved you that the victory is won, not through your own strength or ability, right? This is through him. And so... We're going to do this. I really believe that, you know, sometimes you've got to just, like, put the word into your circumstance. So um, I'm going to ask everyone to close your eyes. And I know there's people who cheat and peek. But I'm going to ask you not to do that. No cheating. <laughs> All right. And I want you, if you're comfortable with it, I don't feel like this is, like, necessity. Me, this helps me. So I think it'll probably help a lot of people. So put your hands out. And uh, I want you to hold in your hand. Either that, that failure that, that you've had in your life that you, that you know is your mistake, that you feel holds you back from being the person you're supposed to be, or that experience of trauma or persecution that has come into your life, hurt you, that you think holds you back from being exceptional, from being the person God made you to be. And I'm just going to read this over you, and I want you to let that break. I want you to let that thing break. It's going to break down. And And we're we're going to let go go of it. In this thing, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. In this thing, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Say it over yourself. It it helps to say it out loud. Some people got to say it out loud. Say it, say it, it, repeat it after me. In this thing, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. One more time. We're gonna, you, know, and you might have to do this at home, too. This might not stop here. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to hear it over and over again. In this thing, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Amen. Amen. You know, we're going to go into one more song. I kind of felt this in my heart. Uh, there's this there's this breaking down of strongholds. And I think we just started doing that, actually. You know, like that's, that's what breaking down strongholds feels like. It feels like separating yourself from the lie that you've been clinging to and embracing a truth that maybe you had forgotten or not known. But I felt like um, there's this parallel between the fire and the water. You know, you, you go back to Genesis. When God floods the earth, he destroys it with water. And he says, I'll never flood the earth again. But then later on in Revelations, he's going to destroy the earth with fire. Or purge it or purify it with fire. Uh, John the Baptist baptizes with water. But he says, the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's, there's this story of going into the furnace. And there's this other story that for whatever it just connects me, and it might not even be a thing, but I think it might be a thing. Um, it, where the, the children of Israel leaving Egypt, they, they, they get up to the Red Sea and God parts the water for them. And you know, he holds back Pharaoh's army with a pillar of fire. There's like this connection there that I, to be perfect, I don't understand it, but I was praying and I just felt like we needed to sing this song about Egypt and we needed to declare over our own lives that the God who, who took Rakshak and Benny through the flames He's going to do that for us. And then the God who rescued people from slavery and strongholds, he's going to do that for us. And we're going to live free in this age. 
We're, we're going to live free here, here on Earth in the land, land of the living. living. We're, we're not going to wait till it's just heaven, heaven man. We're, we're not, not going to wait till it's heaven because, you know what? Here's, here's the thing. We're all pilgrims and foreigners. That's the last line, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What the last thing they said to the king is, even if he doesn't say this, they already said he's going to, but even if he does, we're not... We're not bowing down. You know what that signals? They're looking towards a heavenly kingdom. Their allegiance isn't based on him saving him from, in the, from the things of this life, even though they know he's going to. It's not based on that. It's based on the fact they know they're not just foreigners in Babylon. They're foreigners on earth, man. They're called to a higher Jerusalem, a greater kingdom. And so we share in that. We share in that with them in this moment. And I, I just want to, I want to sing that out. I want to declare that our futures are bright and that we have a heavenly calling and we have a heavenly home and, we have, and we've got something whose, ba- whose maker and builder is God. And we're going to live that calling out. So go ahead, worship team. You guys are awesome.